Okay, let's bow our heads in silent preparation as we prepare for the teaching of God's Word. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you uh, for your word. We know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we thank you, Lord, from Genesis to Revelation. You have inspired the scripture. We thank you, Lord, that we can rely upon it, depend upon it, Lord, and appropriate it by faith. So help us to take in the word of God this morning by faith and receive with humility the ingrat the word of God, which is able to save our soul from the power of sin. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're moving forward in our survey of the Bible to the book of 1 Kings. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Kings. Uh, mainly this morning we're going to deal with introductory matters. And so I'm going to go through, talk through the Bible. We're just going to read it. If you can follow along on the screen, we're going to follow, um, talk through the Bible here and um, just begin here reading this first paragraph. Uh, the first half of 1 Kings traces a life of Solomon. Under his leadership, Israel rises to the peak of her size and glory. Solomon's great accomplishments include the um, unsurpassed splendor of the temple which he constructs in Jerusalem, bringing him worldwide fame and respect. So we know that the kingdom of the, what we call the United Kingdom was at its peak under the reign of Solomon. Uh, we'll see later that Solomon's um, life covers the first section of the book of First Kings and then the divided kingdom occurs in chapter 12. Uh, but Solomon's zeal for God diminishes in his later years. You think the wisest man upon this earth would follow his own wisdom, but uh, the women that he uh, married got him into trouble. Uh, his pagan wives um, uh, divided his heart away from the worship of God and the temple of God. The result, the king with the divided heart lives behind a divided kingdom. I think that's an interesting comment. His heart was divided, therefore his, after his death, his kingdom was divided. For the next century, the book of 1 Kings traces the twin histories of two sets of kings, two nations of disobedient people who are growing indifferent to God's prophets and precepts. And of course, we have the northern and southern kingdom, that division being after chapter 12. Let me reduce the size here so we get the whole chart here on the screen at once. And uh, I like these uh, overviews of each book of the Bible. I love these charts here. Just one glance, you can see what the whole book is all about. So uh, we have here from chapter 1 through chapter 11, verse 43, what we call the United Kingdom. Obviously, we already dealt with uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, we have the lives of Saul, and the second Samuel, David, and then here in 1 Kings, Solomon. So that would be under the United Kingdom, each one reigning 40 years. So this is the first part of the book. And then the key chapter, I think, is the division of the kingdom in chapter 12. Chapter 12, you have the kingdom divided. We have Jeroboam reigning in the north and Roboam reigning in the south. And then we have various kings uh, mentioned in chapter 15, verse 1 through 16, 28. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of this uh, book of 1 Kings deals with Ahab's reign. Ahab's reign. It's interesting. Certain kings are only mentioned in a few verses. Others, we have several chapters. So Ahab is one of those prominent kings of the northern kingdom that is mentioned, along with Elijah, the ministry of Elijah, Elijah the prophet. Uh, you think about 2 Kings has Elijah, uh, the successor. Actually, the reign of Elijah continues into, I think, chapter 2 of 2 Kings. Um, and then we have Elisha ministry coming after Elijah. So we have the reign of Jehoshaphat in Judah in chapters 22, verse 41 to 2250. Uh, he was another godly king. 
Um, and then we finally have the reign of Ahaziah in Israel. And uh, it seems to end abruptly at that point. We'll, we'll deal with why the book was divided into two sections. Originally, First and Second Kings was one book. Uh, I think, I'll just give you the reason up front. I think it was the length of the scroll. <laughs> I think uh, they ran out of room. And so they said, okay, let's cut it off here at this, this section here. So we'd begin the second scroll because you have these long books, long volume, just like they publishers today. Sometimes they have two volumes, uh, Bible knowledge commentary. It's neatly divided in the old and new Testament, but you have certain books that are so long that they divide it into two sections. Uh, that might've been the reason why later on the book was divided into first and second Kings. Um, but it ends here at a uh, Hazari in Israel. Now, the uh, topics, uh, Solomon, of course, this kingdom is in tranquility. Uh, the kingdom of Israel is at its peak, and uh, you have peace under the reign of Solomon. No, no really a uh, lot of engaging in battle or warfare. You have certainly enemies of Israel during that time, but overall, it was a kingdom of peace and tranquility. And then the kingdom is thrown into chaos because of sin and rebellion, and therefore the kingdom's in turmoil from chapter 12 to 2253. Now, the place or location of the capital of uh, the United Kingdom under Solomon is Jerusalem. As David established the city of Jerusalem, he captured Jabus, and then he made it his capital, and then his successor Solomon continued to reign in the city of Jerusalem. And we'll see, uh, by the way, that uh, Solomon is a type of Christ. We'll see that later. And I think Psalm 72 uh, mentions the reign of Solomon, but yet it looks forward to the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ ultimately. Um, and the reign is from the city of Jerusalem. So that's the capital of the United Kingdom. Now, after the kingdom divided, uh, Jerusalem continued to be at the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah, but Samaria became the capital of Israel. So you have two capitals. <clears throat> also, you'll see two worship centers in the northern kingdom, Dan and Bethel. I'll show you those on the map here in a minute. So you have separate worship centers and separate capitals, and that kept the nations divided. <clears throat> now, the time frame, of course, Solomon's reign was 40 years. You have the reign of uh, Saul, David, and Solomon neatly divided into 40 years each, 120 years of the United Kingdom. And then up to the time of Hazariah, this is not the total length of time, certainly for the North or Southern Kingdom, but in the book of 1 Kings, you have 90 years. So from chapter 12 through the reign of Azariah up to that reign, we have 90 years uh, from chapter 12 through 2253. Let's read this introduction. I'm going to try to increase this font um, a little bit so you can see it there in the back. Um, now, uh, the first half of 1 Kings traces the life of Solomon. Under his leadership, Israel rises to the peak of her size and glory. Solomon's great accomplishments include you, you, the unsurpassed splendor of the temple, which he constructs in Jerusalem, breaking him worldwide fame and respect. However, Solomon's zeal for God diminishes in his later years as pagan wives turns his heart away from worship and the temple of God. As a result, the king with a divided heart leaves behind a divided kingdom. For the next century, the book of 1 Kings traces the twin histories of two sets of kings and two nations of disobedient people who are growing indifferent to God's prophets and precepts. Like the two books of Samuel, the two books of Kings were originally one in the Hebrew Bible. The original title was Melchizedek, and uh, the word Kings, taken from the first word in 1 Kings 1.1. 1, 1. And usually this is the case, by the way, uh, in the books of the Old Testament. The first verse typically would be the how they would title. And... Um, all the titles which we have in our modern day English versions are taken from the Septuagint. Not from the Hebrew text, but from the Septuagint. Um, so we have here, um, Vea Melech, uh, the now word now king, uh, 
and we have that from the title Kings, the Septuagint artificially divided the book of Kings in the middle of the story of Ahazariah into two books. Uh, it called the book of Samuel first and second kingdoms, and the books of Kings third and fourth kingdoms. The Septuagint may have divided Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles into two books each because the Greek required a greater amount of scroll space than did the Hebrew. That's what I said earlier. You know, you run out of space. Okay, let's start the next <laughs> section here. It seems kind of arbitrary we, between the sections here. Keep in mind, the book divisions are not inspired. Certainly, we finally have our English text, but the Word of God is inspired. The content of those books is and certainly inspired. Just like our tap, chapter titles, chapter and verses, that came later in uh, church history. Uh, we have chapter titles in the medieval ages and then verses uh, <coughs> later. Now, the Latin title for these books is Liber Regem uh, Tertius et Cortis. Now, I have a disadvantage. <laughs> I have I don't I, I didn't take Latin I didn't have Latin I had uh, I took uh, even English I didn't do too well but uh, <laughs> that's just my upbringing so <laughs> apologize for mispronunciation but uh, third or fourth book of Kings so we have that Latin title here for third and fourth book of Kings now the author here now obviously since we're dealing with the history of the Kings up to even Second Kings the Babylonian captivity, and then maybe a little later, there's someone who lived after that period of time who was the author. And just simple summary, uh, some think that Jeremiah wrote the book of Kings. Uh, so Jeremiah is more than likely uh, the author of the book of First and Second Kings. Uh, he says the author is certainly unknown. The, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us who the author is. Uh, the author of First and Second Kings is unknown, but evidence supports the Talmudic tradition that Kings was written by the prophet Jeremiah. So this is simply tradition, but uh, you know I think it's a good assumption that Jeremiah would certainly be well qualified and lived during that time frame to write this. Uh, the author was clearly a prophet historian, as seen in the prophet expose of apostasy. Both First and Second Kings emphasizes God's righteous judgment on idolatry and immorality. The style of these books is also similar to that found in Jeremiah, which is interesting. The phrase to this day found in 1 Kings 8.8 and 8, chapter 12 verse 19 indicates a time of authorship prior to the Babylonian captivity and therefore that occurred in 586 BC. However, the last two chapters of 2 Kings were written after the captivity probably by a Jewish captive in Babylon because the history is later than the Babylonian captivity. Now, evidently, the majority of First and Second Kings was written before 586 BC by a compiler who had access to several historical documents. Some of these are mentioned, the book of the Acts of Solomon, and I'll just scroll over that, chapter 11, verse 41. Now, the rest of the Acts of Solomon, all that they did in his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Now, that's not a book of Scripture, but that's a historical document. And so you have several of these mentioned uh, throughout the book of First and Second Kings, references to other historical documents. So similar, in, in a similar way, Luke, by the way, the introduction to the book of Luke, Luke did research uh, historically to... Uh, mention the uh, to uh, expound on the life of Christ. So we have these extra biblical books, but historical records that were drawn upon uh, in the life of these kings. So there's several that are mentioned, by the way. So when you run across, what is this book? Well, it's a extra biblical book, but a historical record that is drawn upon. So it does document accurate history. Certainly, inspiration would. Um, allow for research and extra biblical bo uh, books, but finally the byproduct God superintended would be the inerrant word of God. The book of Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, another reference in 1 Kings 14, 19. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, indeed they're written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So that is another historical record 
that was drawn upon to write uh, the book of 1 Kings. The book of Chronicles of the Kings of Judah mentioned in 1429. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Also another reference in 157. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So these books may have been part of the official court records according to 2 Kings 18.18. 18. And when they had called to the king Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, uh, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder came out to them. So again, there's individuals that took official court records uh, that was drawn upon. In addition, Isaiah 36 to 39 was probably used as a source. By the way, if you look at Isaiah 36 and compare it to 2 Kings 18 to 20, um, there is uh, almost a word for word identity. Uh, later on, by the way, when you look at those sections, let's see when just briefly look at 2 Kings chapter 18. I remember one thing I discovered um, as a young believer uh, reading through the Psalms. And I was noticed that the, the one song was repeated in the book of uh, Second Kings, or no, uh, the life of David, which would be uh, Second Samuel, almost word for word. And I saw several of these, you know, scripture verses that were almost identical, repeated. Uh, we have one example, by the way, in uh, Malachi. Uh, Malachi uh, mentions the future millennial temple, or, not, or the um, mount in Jerusalem, Isaiah 2. And Malachi, I think four are almost identical. If you look at the first few verses of Malachi and Isaiah two, uh, Isaiah, excuse me, Isaiah thirty, uh, Second Samuel, Second Kings eighteen twenty, um, and then uh, first Isaiah thirty six through thirty nine. I think this is the parallel chapter here, Isaiah. I don't know if we're going to read from that, but Isaiah 36. Take a look here real quick. 36 to 39. So you could read through that section here, and you'll see um, similarity between those sections of Scripture. We're not going to do that uh, this morning, but you can make that comparison later. Now, date and setting. The book of 1 Kings or Book of Kings was written to the remaining kingdom of Judah before and after its Babylonian exile. The majority was compiled by a contemporary of Jeremiah, if not by Jeremiah himself. It is a record of disobedience, idolatry, and ungodliness, which serves as an explanation for the Assyrian captivity of Israel. Now, in the Book of Second Kings, you have the capture of the northern kingdom. So it's not until the Book of Second Kings... I think chapter 17 of uh, the book of 2 Kings, we have the Assyrian captivity. Um, and then, so we have that occurred in 722 B.C. And the Babylonian captivity occurred in 586 B.C. 1 Kings covers the 120 years from the beginning of Solomon's reign in 971 B.C. That is a critical date in history. If you're Old Testament history, remember... 971 B.C. That is a key date you need to keep in your mind. That's the date of the kingdom's division. Just like 1446 B.C. is the date of the Exodus. 971 B.C. is the date of the divided kingdom. Uh, so 1 Kings covers the 120 years from the beginning of Solomon's reign in 971 through Azariah's reign, ending in 851 B.C. The key date is 931 B.C., the year the kingdom was divided into the northern nation of Israel and the southern nation of Judah. And he has a brief chart, a little fuzzy here, but we have the reign of Saul beginning 1043 B.C., David 
10, 11 BC. And it's interesting, David lived about a thousand years before Christ. Uh, we go back to Abraham. Abraham lived a little more than 2,000 years before Christ. And so we have um, that, that history. And then 931, where we have Jeroboam the first and Robum the one in the southern kingdom. Um, and then the further kings of Israel mentioned there in first kings. And then the kings, God, the kings in the southern kingdom that are mentioned in the book of first kings. All right. Theme and purpose. The theme of 1 Kings is that, is that the welfare of Israel and Judah depend upon the covenant faithfulness of the people and their king. Historically, it was written to give an account of the reigns of the kings from Solomon to Jehoshaphat, Judah, and Azariah, Israel. The two books of Kings as a whole traces a monarchy from the point of its greatest prosperity under Solomon to its demise and destruction in the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. Theologically, 1 Kings provides a prophetically orientated evaluation of the spiritual moral causes that lead to political and economic effects in the two kingdoms. Material is too selected to be considered a biography of the kings. Now, some it's interesting, some secular commentaries um, simply say, well, this is simply a record of the kings, but there's a purpose in writing this. There are certain kings that are wicked and they're emphasized, such as Ahab, to show the nation of Israel what not to do and the consequences of rebellion against God, certain godly kings that are highlighted. Uh, so it has a theological purpose, not simply a record of history. The history is important, uh, but there's a theological purpose behind that. For example, Omni, Omri was one of the Israel's most important rulers from a political point of view. This is an important point. Um, if you look at extra biblical history, you have a lot of information about Amri. He was very <coughs> prominent politically, <coughs> but because of his moral corruption, his achievements are dismissed in eight verses. Think about that. Only eight verses mention Amri. If you go outside of biblical history, he's very prominent, very strong leader, very strong, but um, he was ungodly. So biblical history only records eight verses. Now think about when God rewrites history. You know, obviously certain things, when you have a history textbook, certain things you highlight in our country's history that are emphasized, uh, certain great achievements. And think about what God will emphasize one day in history, things that are important to him versus things we think historically significant in our lifetime. So God is the author of history. It's, by the way, when we think of history, it's his story. His story. Now, the lives of these kings are used to teach several basic principles, and I highlighted this. Number one, man cannot properly rule himself without conscious dependence on the help of God. It's so true. And our early presidents understood this. They understood. They had the example of these kings. Now, certainly our presidents were not kings. We chose not to have a king kingship. Um, but they patterned their lives after certain godly kings. Now, and therefore, you know, in our history, the success of our country depends on the godliness of the nation. It's critical, absolutely critical. Um, Number two, the kings had great responsibility as God's administrators because the circumstances of the nation depended in large part upon their faithfulness to Yahweh. You know, their success of the nation or their uh, failure depended upon their faithfulness to the Lord. Number three, the kings were illustrations of the people as a whole. Just as they disregarded God's prophets, so did the people. Think about when you have ungodly leaders. Many times the people follow. You know, we look at uh, our own country. You have leadership at the top that is in rebellion against God. What do you have? Masses that follow that. Uh, godly leadership is a very important. And then number four, observance of God's law produces blessing. Keep in mind they were still under the Mosaic system. And therefore, uh, the nation was required to obey God's law. 
And when they did so, the blessings that are mentioned in Deuteronomy 28 through 30 would happen. Economic prosperity, for instance. But a, post, a national disaster, by the way, as mentioned in Deuteronomy 28 through 30, um, came upon the nation because of rebellion against the law. But apostasy is rewarded by uh, judgment. And that's exactly why we have the northern and southern captivity. All right, key to first kings. Key word, division of the kingdom. Uh, therefore, the key verses uh, he mentions here is chapter nine of first kings. And then I know it's a typo by there. It's not a four dash four. What is that? Uh, chapter nine, verse four, I think, through 14. It's probably what he meant. And chapter 11, verse 11. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and up in uprightness to do all according to all, all according that I've commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. Another key verse, chapter 11, verse 11. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. So it's because of Solomon's rebellion we have the division of the kingdom. Now, the turning point, again, as I stated at the beginning, chapter 12. The critical turning point in 1 Kings occurs in chapter 12, when the united kingdom becomes a divided kingdom. Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam becomes king and unwisely leads the nation into a civil war, which tragically rips the nation into two separate and at times conflicting nations. You think about the civil war in our own nation's history. And uh, so we have a civil war certainly in the nation of Israel. Instead of unity, First Kings records a history of two kings, two capitals, and two religions. And it's certainly true of the Northern Kingdom. They completely disregard the Mosaic Law. Temple sacrifices was required to be at the temple in Jerusalem. They established their own worship system, which was a violation of the Mosaic Law. And I think that's why you don't have any godly kings in the Northern Kingdom. They would not go down to Jerusalem. They divided the North and the South, and so they remained in the North. Uh, and because of their alternative system of worship, they violated God's word. Um, now, Christ in 1 Kings. Solomon typifies Christ. So in the Old Testament, if you want to talk about, you know, looking forward to Christ, you have prophecy. So there are over 100 and some prophecies in regard to, I think, 110 by one count, prophecies of Christ's first coming, 110. Um, and then 300 or so prophecies of Christ's second coming, which haven't been fulfilled. So you have Old Testament prophecy that pointed to Christ. You have certainly the pre-incarnate uh, appearance of the angel of the Lord, I think, was Christ in the Old Testament. And then you have typology. Typology of the tabernacle, beautiful portrait of Christ as the light of the world. We think of Christ as our sacrifice. Um, so you have all that typology taught through that before. The typology of the tabernacle pointed the nation to the coming Messiah. So you have typology, which was fulfilled in the New Testament. The anti-type, one corresponding to the type, is found in the New Testament. So I think in the sense of Solomon, you have typological figures, by the way. Now, one individual that I think that does the best work on this, at least uh, there was well, a couple individuals, uh, but I think C.I. Schofield and his Schofield Study Bible list over 40 some types of Christ in the Old Testament. If you want that list, I you know I could you know email you and send you that list. But Schofield Reference Bible mentions the various types of Christ in the Old Testament. He does a great job in that. Now, unfortunately, people can go overboard on typology 
and add in, I think Roy Zuck's book on basic Bible interpretation deals with proper use of typology. You have you know, the balance. Some people eliminate all types, you know, and others go the other extreme and see a type behind everything. And you have to have the biblical balance of what is a type and not a type. I think Solomon certainly is a type. And the reason by, why that, let's turn to Psalm 72. I'm going to finish reading this, but turn to Psalm 72. We're going to read Psalm 72. And we see, even though that, that, that Psalm was mainly a song of Solomon related to his kingdom, ultimately it foreshadows the kingdom of Christ and his righteous reign. So while you're turning there, I'll finish reading here the Christ and First Kings. Solomon typifies Christ in a number of ways. His fable wisdom points ahead to Jesus Christ, who became for us wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Solomon's fame, glory, wealth, and honor foreshadow Christ in his kingdom. Solomon's rulership brings knowledge, peace, and worship. However, despite Solomon's splendor, the Son of Man later says of his coming, Indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. It's interesting, in Matthew 12, 42, he, uh, he mentions this, The Queen of South will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Christ is greater. And you add that hermeneutical rule, by the way, the anti-type exceeds the type. And that's true with Christ. The anti-type exceeds the type. Now, the prophet Elijah is more typical of John the Baptist. And the New Testament states that, by the way. He was typological. You have that confusion when it says this is Elijah. The idea of this Elijah means he's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. <clears throat> and therefore, John the Baptist was typical of Elijah's ministry. Um, so he is more typical of John the Baptist than of Christ, but his prophetic ministry and miraculous works illustrate aspects of the life of Christ. The miracles that he performed parallel, in some sense, many of the miracles that Christ performed. See, at various stages, by the way, it's interesting when you look at Old Testament history, various stages in which miracles were prominent, such as in the Exodus generation, and then the days of Elijah and Elisha, and then later in the New Testament period in the apostolic era, there are certain eras of history that emphasizes the miraculous. All right, let's take a look at Song 72 then. And we're going to read through this song, Song 72. And we will see initially that this is a Song of Solomon, as the title indicates. A Song of Solomon, but we will see the uh, many of these verses ultimately point to the Millennial Kingdom. So a lot of these verses deal with Christ's future reign over all the world. Give your king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. By the way, if you compare, I think it's um, Isaiah 2, uh, we have some of the same language of Christ's millennial kingdom. He will reign with righteousness, and he will reign with justice. Um, the mountains will bring forth peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. You know, his kingdom will be a kingdom of peace, Isaiah 9, uh, verses 6 and 7. So we can add, and we can go through this section, by the way, and it can show you um, many verses dealing with Christ's millennial reign that parallel language here. Um, now, he will bring justice to the poor of the people, and he will save the children to the needy. He will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endures throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days, the righteous <laughs> shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more. I think ultimately the righteous reign of Christ. Um, righteousness shall prevail under his millennial reign. Notice verse 8. He shall have dominion also from the sea to sea, and this is between the Dead Sea and Mediterranean Sea. Jerusalem's between those two seas. Southern boundary, so we have eastern-western boundary. Southern boundary, uh, or excuse me, 
The northern boundary, wait a second. <laughs> this river, I think, is the, the uh, no, this is the Nile River. No, excuse me. Hold on a second here. What verse were we on here? Jump, jump down here. Verse 8. Yeah, this is the Euphrates, right? That's the northern boundary of the nation. And we'll see Solomon's kingdom extended up to the Euphrates River. Uh, he shall have dominion from sea to sea, Dead Sea, Mediterranean Sea, and from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. So his reign will be over all the earth. Now, Solomon did reign between the two seas and up to the river Euphrates, but he did not reign over all the earth. Think about that. Solomon did not reign over all the earth. Um, so Christ will. So again, this foreshadows the reign of Christ. Jesus Christ will reign over all the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. His enemies will lick the dust. So you think about the coming kings that will give homage to the king, uh, the king of kings and lord of lords, the kings of Tarshish, the area of Spain, and the isles will bring presents. The king of Sheba and Seba, certainly the queen of Sheba visited Solomon, uh, but this can foreshadow kings that will come to Jerusalem and give homage to the Lord Jesus, will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Now, ultimately, that's only the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. All kings will bow down before him, every king. And then all nations will serve him. He will have universal domain over all the world. He will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also with him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy. He will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. And precious shall be the, their blood in his sight. He will preserve and protect life. He shall live, and the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually, and daily he shall be praised. Now, ultimately through him as our mediator, uh, that's how that will work. But he daily shall be praised. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth on the tops of the mountains, and fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the sea shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him, and all nations shall call him blessed. I think ultimately his name being endured forever is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. All nations will call him blessed. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Christ's messianic reign. All the earth will be filled with the Shekinah glory of the Lord. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So, Again, we have certain elements that we see in Solomon's reign, but ultimately, in the, the way the Bible works, that's a foreshadowing of the Messiah, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think the idea that Solomon is a type of Christ is validated in the Old Testament. Certainly clear, especially in this song, Song 72. All right, let's go back to uh, talk through the Bible. Um, so we dealt with the... the the uh, typology of Christ. And that's one thing I like about talk through the Bible. Uh, he tries to see the either prophecy or typology in each book of the Bible, which I don't know any other work that does that. I know individual works that deal with typology, but in surveys, as far as that's concerned, I think that's why I really like this particular survey of the Bible. Contribution to the Bible. In 1 Samuel, the kingdom was established. In 2 Samuel, it was consolidated. 1 Kings brings a kingdom from the height of its glory to a sudden abyss of division and decline. This book begins a sad pattern in the port portrayal of each king that is carried on in 2 Kings. The account shifts between the kings of Israel and Judah in a way that synchronizes the two monarchies. The accession year of every king is dated in terms of its overlap with the ruler of the other kingdom. Many times you'll see such and such king began in the second year of that particular king, 
And so you have northern and southern kingdoms compared. This person reigned in the third year of this reign, and therefore you have that synchronization. So the count shifts between the kings of Israel and Judah in a way that synchronizes the two monarchies. The accession year of every king is dated in terms of its overlap with the ruler of the other kingdom. Introductory and concluding formulas are used, and a theological verdict on the reign of each king is passed. And that verdict is, this was a good king or a bad king. Where do we get that? Well, it'll, it'll, the text will say, this king such and such was a good king. And it doesn't mean he was good in all, all aspects. Or a bad king. That doesn't necessarily mean that king was bad in all aspects. We have one example in the northern kingdom, I think, one exception that was started out well and ended up bad. Uh, but the overall summary and you know, is a conclusion we need to reach. And I think um, in the northern kingdom, there were no God, ultimately godly kings in God's eyes. In the southern kingdom, we have eight out of 20. Eight out of 20. Um, now, so we have a verdict on the reign of each king. Um, the life and reign of David is the standard by which the kings of Judah are judged. Interesting. First Kings also shows how the prophetic ministry came into its maturity at the end of the United Kingdom and throughout the divided kingdom. The book describes the ministries of several of God's prophets. What's interesting, I have a chart that lists certain the prophets and what king that they ministered under. Very interesting. When you look at the minor prophets, what we call minor prophets at the end of the Bible, Many of them ministered during the days of the northern kingdom or southern kingdom. So it's always good to have a chart that lists all the kings of the north and south and then the various prophets who ministered in those kingdoms. Maybe I'll compile. So I have something in my um, PowerPoint slides, but I need to tweak it. <laughs> the dates are not exactly right. Uh, so I'll just show you what it is. Let, let, well, want to do that right now while I'm talking about it. I So if you want to take a photo, maybe do it later because I'm uh, not everything on this list is right. Um, but later on I have here, we're going to go through these slides here in a minute, but at the end I have this right here. Um, this is slide 21, right? Okay, let's type in 21, enter. I know you can do that. There you go. <laughs> I know it's hard to see. <laughs> But uh, found this online, a uh, particular individual. Some of these dates I would modify. I uh, haven't done it yet. But what's interesting about this chart is he'll mention like Obadiah's reign. Uh, he reigned under, ministered under Jehoram. He has a question mark there, but some place in his ministry under Jehoram. Joel, the prophet, uh, ministered uh, in the reign of Joash, the southern kingdom, by the way. In the kingdom of Israel, we have Elijah's ministry. He ministered uh, for three kings, uh, Ahaziah, Joram, and Jehu. Notice that, Elisha. Elijah ministered under the days of Ahab and Omri. So this is very interesting how we had the prophets, you know, um, maybe someone with PowerPoint uh, you know, you have to create a table, and I know it's, you can do that in PowerPoint, but if someone wants to do that, I'll give you the information, and we'll modify that. <laughs> but really, I have to modify some of those dates in there. Maybe we'll do that at some point. Uh, and then he has a second one here, mentioning the various uh, Isaiah's ministry, Micah. Uh, we have four kings of Judah that he ministered under. So this is very helpful as far as trying to date uh, when the prophets ministered during what king, uh, what king's northern or southern kingdom. All right, let's go back here to, just thought I'd preview that for you. All right. Okay, um, where were we? Now, we were, the first king shows how the prophetic ministry came into maturity at the end of the United Kingdom and throughout the divided kingdom. The book describes the ministries of several of God's prophets. Now, a survey of 1 Kings, the first half of 1 Kings concerns a life of one of the most amazing men who ever lived, more than any other man before or since, since he knew how to 
amass and creative use great wealth. Now, obviously, God gave him that wealth because, first of all, he requested wisdom. So God gave him wisdom and wealth uh, because he, he sought God first. Uh, with the sole exception of Jesus Christ, Solomon is the wisest man in human history. He brings Israel to the peak of its size and glory. Yet the kingdom is disrupted soon after his death, torn in two by civil strife. This book divides clearly into two sections, the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom. United Kingdom under Solomon, chapters 1 through 11. These chapters give an account of Solomon's attainment to the throne, wisdom, architectural achievements, fame, wealth, and tragic unfaithfulness. In chapter 1, Solomon's half-brother, Adonijah attempts to take the throne as David's death is nearing. So he tries to have a usurper, uh, but he is put to death uh, by Solomon. But Nathan the prophet alerts David, who quickly directs the coronation of Solomon as co-regent. So he was established before David died, and therefore Solomon is the, the leader Solomon still has to consolidate his power and deal with those who oppose his rule. Only when this is done, the kingdom is established in the hands of Solomon in chapter 2, verse 46. So that passage indicates, So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. Thus the kingdom was established in the hands of Solomon. Solomon's ungodly marriages... <laughs> We're familiar with that. Um, of course, you know, a thousand women. <laughs> we have 700 concubines, 300 wives, 700 concubines, a thousand women, uh, which got him in the trouble in the end. And then notice here, uh, Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Bad move. Now, I know that's the way you consolidated power. Hey, you just marry your daughter and we're going to, you know, get along as nations. But, you know, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, what uh, agreement has light with darkness? Uh, it doesn't. And then ultimately that caused problems for Solomon. And notice here, he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Now, later on, we'll see Solomon built shrines so that these women could worship their false gods. And it's just amazing, uh, you know, how the, uh, uh, by doing this, uh, that caused Solomon's downfall. Now, Solomon's ungodly marriages eventually turned his heart from the Lord, but he began well with a genuine love for God and a desire for wisdom. This wisdom leads to an expansion of Israel at the zenith of her power. Solomon's empire stretches from the border of Egypt to the border of Babylonia, and peace prevails. From a theocratic perspective, Solomon's great achievements is the building of the temple. The ark is placed in this exquisite building, which is filled with the glory of God. Solomon offers a magnificent prayer of dedication and binds the people with an oath to remain faithful to Yahweh. I think that uh, dedication is awesome. He talked about God who is omnipresent. He said, you know, you're going to localize your presence here, but we, but no building can contain you because you are om omnipresent. And so we have the attributes of God, and maybe as one of our studies we'll read that dedication. I think it's an aw awesome chapter that he did when he dedicates the temple. But um, let's continue here. Um because the Lord's with him, Solomon continues to grow in fame, power, and wealth. However, his wealth later becomes a source of trouble when he begins to purchase forbidden items. He acquires many foreign wives who led him into idolatry. It is an irony of history that this wisest man, wisest of men, acts as a fool in his old age. God pronounces judgment and foretells that Solomon's son will rule only a fraction of the kingdom of Judah. Now, the section of the divided kingdom, upon Solomon's death, God's word came to pass. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, chooses the foolish course of promising several uh, more severe taxation. That's another key, too, in that chapter 12. He said, 
you know what? Solomon taxed you, but I'm but, but my taxation will be nothing. It will be will exceed Solomon and his taxation. I'm going to lay even more burden upon you. And that caused a rift. One of the reasons the rift occurred uh, because of overtaxation. Uh, he chooses to listen to the counsel of his ungodly young friends versus godly older counsel. That's a very interesting uh, chapter there. Um, so he listened to on, on wise counsel. They made them their king, leaving only Judah and Benjamin in the south under Robum. So this ungodly counsel led to a division between north and south. This is the beginning of the chaotic period with two nations and two sets of kings. Continual enmity and strife existed between the northern and southern kingdom. The north is plagued by apostasy. Drobum sets up a false system of worship and the south by idolatry. Of all the northern and southern kings listed in the book, only Asa in chapter 15, verses 9 through 24, and Jehoshaphat, chapter 22, verse 41 through 50, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. All the others are idolaters, usurpers, and murderers. I have a chart later on the northern kingdom and how many kings were murdered. <laughs> I think we have at least nine or ten murders and deaths by tragic means in the northern kingdom. And uh, I'll show you that later. Now, Ahab brings a measure of cooperation between the northern and southern kingdoms, but he reaches new depths of wickedness as a king. He is the man who introduces Jezebel. And that's familiar. You think about David and Bathsheba. Well, we have Ahaz and Jezebel. <laughs> um, Jezebel introduces, uh, you know, Baal worship to Israel. He, oh, Ahab introduces Jezebel's Baal worship to Israel. And again, you had the showdown with Elijah, member of the prophets of Baal. The prophet Elijah ministers during this low period in Israel's history, providing a ray of light and witness of the word and power of God. Isn't that interesting? Interesting that God has his servants in the darkest days of history. There's bright spots in the darkest days of history. God has his faithful servant. I remember he said to Elijah when he got discouraged, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal in the nation of Israel. Isn't that something? So Ahab's encounter with Elijah never brings him to turn from his false gods to God. Um, Ahab's treachery in the matter of Naboth's vineyards. <laughs> That's another interesting account. Remember, he wanted this vineyard, which is next to him, and you know his wife Jezebel. That's no problem. Just take it. <laughs> he didn't want to do that, but then he had it murdered, and you know took possession, and he was judged. Because of that, but Jezebel, no problem. Just take, just go ahead and take it. She had no scruples whatsoever. <laughs> she was a wicked woman. <laughs> um, so Ahab's treachery in the matter of Naboth's vineyard caused a prophetic rebuke from Elijah in chapter twenty-one. Ahab repents, but later dies in battle because of his refusal to heed the words of Micaiah, another prophet of God. And remember. He speaks of Micaiah. He always speaks about bad things, you know. Come here, give us a word. What does God say about this? Shall I go, you know? And uh, he, he said, go ahead. You'll be a victor. Why, are you, why aren't you telling me the truth? Okay, let me tell you the truth. All right, don't go. See, he always speaks bad things. <laughs> like, unbelievable, you know. <laughs> People refuse to hear the truth, right? Uh, so we won't go further into, into the outline. I think we covered the introduction, but I want to point out a couple things here uh, before we close. I think there was one more thing here. Let's go look at um, the uh, my slideshow here. I want to go back to the beginning here. So where are we at right now in our survey? Um, we did this in our introduction to the Bible. If you can recall that, I don't know how long ago that was, but um, I redid this chart here. You have this by Howard Hendricks, his chart here on the left, which is neat because it places the books of the Bible 
side by side as far as chronology is concerned. But when you're looking at the Old Testament, there are nine stages of Old Testament history. If you want a mastery of uh, the big picture idea of the Old Testament, memorize the nine stages. I think this will be great for kids to memorize the nine stages of Old Testament history. They are creation. And as you see with the number one, the book of Genesis covers creation. Patriarchal. Again in Genesis, we have uh, chapter 12 of Genesis to the end of the book. We have four individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Patriarchal stage. Okay. Then we have the book of Exodus, which is the Exodus stage of history. So the book of Genesis, two stages of Old Testament history, creation, patriarchal, Exodus, Exodus generation. And then that would cover Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, by the way. Conquest would be Joshua. They went into the land. Uh, they went into the promised land and conquered it, not all of it completely. Then we have the stages of the judges. Um, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, the last verse of the book of Judges. And therefore, Judges and Ruth, by the way. Ruth was faithful, by the way. You have Ruth and Judges there. Ruth uh, lived during the days of the Judges, so I like the way he parallels uh, that time frame. Sixth stage would be the United Kingdom. United Kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon, each one reigning 40 years. And then in 1 Kings, we have the divided kingdom called the chaotic kingdom stage. And therefore, this section here of the chart, we have the book of 1 Kings. We have First and Second Chronicles, 2 Kings. Solomon wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Uh, we have those books in that period of time, chaotic kingdom. Then captivity. Obviously, the Babylonian captivity, Northern Kingdom went into captivity and 721 B.C. by the Assyrians, Southern Kingdom, 586 captivity, and then return from Babylon, which deals with, by the way, we have the 70 years of captivity, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then we have the ministry after the captivity, the book of Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then the last three uh, post-exilic prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So these are the nine stages. So you can really work through the Old Testament history in a broad sense by going through the nine stages. I'll repeat them. Creation, patriarchal. Third stage is Exodus. Fourth stage is conquest. Fifth stage is judges. Sixth stage, United Kingdom. Seventh, chaotic or divided kingdom. Eighth, captivity. And nine, return. And uh, that's an easy way to you know, master the history of the Old Testament. Uh, and then New Testament, we can correspondingly, you know, divide it into three sections in the New Testament. We won't get into that, but uh, there's your Old Testament chronology in a nutshell. We'll stop right there. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, this book of First Kings. Help us to draw the lessons we need to, we need to learn from these, uh, this section of the Word of God. And I pray, Father, that you might continue to help us to develop a love for your truth, a love for your Word, whether Old or New Testament. And we pray uh, these things, ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.